<laughs> you put your Tom Cruise glasses on too, like me. I know. <laughs> and we're like matching black shirts today. Ooh, yay, we're back being live. And today we're talking about the Paris salons, correct? Yes, and the uh, this one actually, I was writing this and um, writing the clues and the uh, or the questions for it. And I was actually like, a lot of people aren't gonna know. I mean, there's some of these names I only found out because I was doing research on other people. <laughs> so I was like, this one might be a little bit harder. So I was, wasn't was trying to make it too hard. Yeah, yeah. I was looking at the questions. I was like, oh, I wouldn't know any of this stuff. I'd be so <laughs> confused all the time. Well, we did, we've done a couple of them as podcasts already that haven't been released yet. So that'll, yeah. that'll help a little bit. And yeah, definitely. It'll get people interested in to see who these ladies are. I love the ladies of the salon. You know, they were like fancy ladies who, you know, were ahead of their time. I know. Well, it was, uh, what's really great about it is it really was like the only way for women to really get together. Mm -hmm. If you weren't allowed to get together um, as single women, you know, without a man in a public space, like you couldn't go to a cafe, you couldn't go to all those things. I mean, could you imagine that now? Yeah, you needed a chaperone all yeah. the time. So weird. I find Forget that very that. Right. People Forget need that business. Yeah, I don't I feel like that went on for way too long. Like when did that end really? I think I think it was I mean, I think it was maybe early nineteenth early nineteen hundreds, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, quite some I'll time. have to look I'll have to look it up again. I'll have to look it up and see yeah. when when that was. And the salons were also a way to show art without having well, there's two diff there's two different ones. So there's the salons that people would hold in their houses, like their little like, you know, meet and greet happy hours. And then there was the Paris salons, which is where they would show their art. Um, but I think that I think the salons, I think that the name is so closely tied together because it was kind of the same thing. You kind of come together. Um, and the salons, uh, you know, the salons that people would ha have in their home would be, you know, a lot of um, they'd invite all the intellectual people and actor, you know, the actors and writers and all the really cool, the cool people. Yeah. The cool kids would be hanging out. Yeah. You know, doing cool kid stuff as they did. Yes. <laughs> and they don't do salons anymore in their homes, do they? But I don't think so. I mean, I think some people like uh, some people want to do them. I think it, I think it's a great idea. I think it'd be really cool to do it. Um, I mean, some people were doing them way back when one of the ladies um, was doing them every day. Oh, a Paris salon every day. Yeah, she was doing them every day. And some people would do them like once a week. So it wasn't, um, you know, as frequent. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a lot of work to have people in your house all the time too. Yeah. Like hanging out. I don't know. There's some people here who still have people for um like a dinner every week. I know they invite them to their home and and just strangers, anybody can come. Yeah. And brings food to share. That's yeah, kind of I don't know about that. I don't know if I'd be like, just come on over, doors open. <laughs> I wouldn't really want to be the woman doing it. I'd want to like visit and leave. Yeah. <laughs> hey Kathy. Nice to have you, Kathy. Oh, we're so glad that you're here. We're talking about the Paris salons today. There's so much to learn. Hello, Don. Hey, Don. Don. Uh oh, I was having a problem getting in. Sometimes the internet can be a little funky. I know, like, because we're using StreamYard too, sometimes it's strange to, to log yeah. in as well. But normally it should be okay. You got on, most importantly. We're happy you're here. Yes, we are. Uh, we love that you guys are so interactive with us and you you answer our trivia questions. Yes, I know what we were saying. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard it. We were, I was uh, having a hard time with this one because some of the ladies aren't that well known. Um, I mean, even to me, I was kind of, uh, there was one of them that I found because of somebody else. So I was just like, I really didn't know a whole lot about this woman. So I was just like, uh oh, this one might be hard. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should make this multiple choice. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, I'm trying to find that. Do you have that email? Do you, you have the email I sent you with all the names? I and do. The okay. Just put that in the chat now because it's up here. All the questions are on my screen. So oh, these are Tilled Rosé. Good job, Don. Rosé is good all year round. In Paris, they would, if you ordered a rosé in like January, they'd look at you like you were crazy. Yeah, they really feel like it's a summer drink here. Yeah, but I, it's like champagne. You just, you enjoy and drink what you want, when you want. Completely agree with that. I'm more of a 
white wine girl anyway that includes champagne and rosé. <laughs> I, I was it's I've never like once it starts to kind of get cold. Um we had like a really rainy day a couple of weeks ago and I was like, "Oh, I kind of want some red wine." Yeah. Well, when it's cold and rainy, red wine is perfect. Yeah. Which is why they drink it like basically all year round in Paris because we have so mm -hmm. much rainy cold here. Yeah. But let's hold on to the last days of summer, right, guys? <laughs> I've got, I think they, I think Wednesday, we've had beautiful weather for the like last week and a half in, in Portland. And we're supposed to, I think, do Wednesday maybe. And then it looks like rain. And then that means it'll be like basically rainy till June. Mm, oh my gosh, very Portland. You guys are vampires. It's gray and rainy. That's why when people are like, oh, you go in the winter to Paris, isn't it like cold and rainy? I'm like, it's just like here, but way better. <laughs> Like actually, <laughs> so it doesn't really like I'm just kind of used to the gray and rain when I'm in Paris. Yeah, I mean I think we're all here, and the city looks nice in it. It's fine. I don't mind. Yeah. I just think it's cold. There's no yeah. such thing as bad weather. It's just bad clothing, isn't that what they say? Like you're not wearing the proper clothing. Oh yeah, I, I did a few years ago. It was in January. It was like really, really windy, like bone chilling, cut through you rain and wind and i didn't really like i don't actually still even have like a coat coat like i refuse to get a puffy coat because everybody here in oregon wears nothing but puffy coats and i won't get one <laughs> and so i had this other coat that was more like a fashion coat and the whole time i was there the french guy was with he was just like aren't you cold i was like no i'm fine <laughs> I'm anti puffy coats. <laughs> Meanwhile, my toes were like freezing. <laughs> Get the puffy coat given. Join the club. No, nope, I won't do it. I won't do it. <laughs> I won't do it. <laughs> no, because everybody knows how much I hate those. So everybody, all my friends would be like, oh, you got the puffy coat. <laughs> <laughs> Finally gave in. So yeah. we're talking about five different ladies. Say four. One, two, three, four. And I'll have Claudine kind of introduce each one so you can kind of keep them in the back of your mind. Maybe you know some of them already, maybe you don't. But I'll have Claudine give a little intro on each. Well, I'll try to be careful because I'm really bad at giving things away. Uh -huh. um, but Ninon de L'Enclos, um, we've done an episode about her that's coming out, I think, next month or so. Um, she was actually a courtesan and she was amazing. I can't wait for that episode to come out. But Ninon um, was really interesting. She, from a very early age, she decided she knew she just didn't want to get married. And her father was really supportive of her, but her mother was not. And her mother, um, her father was sent, uh, he was exiled out of France. And so to make sure that she didn't ever have to just get married off, she went out and lost her virginity. Yeah. And then she ended up becoming one of like the biggest courtesans of the time. I mean, that's one way to like defy your mother. Yeah, but she also held a, a incredibly popular salon that she would do every single day of the week. She had this uh, had a every salon day. every day from five to seven, which is funny because that's always a uh, what did they call the cinq cinq uh, cinq the hour where it used to be. They would say that that was when your um, mistress when uh, men would m visit their mistresses. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe it came, maybe that came from Nino. It could be, could be. I mean, I'll, do some, I'll have to look into that a little bit. Um, and then there's Juliette Racamier. She is, um, everybody will know her from a very famous painting that Jacques-Louis David, David did of her that's in the Louvre of her laying down on like a chaise lounge. It's actually called a Racamier is what they ended up naming that couch. She um, was very young when she first came to Paris and when she got married, which is a whole interesting story. That's the one that that's the one, Crystal, where you were like, wait a minute, who, it, that's the father or that's the dad? <laughs> yeah, that was weird. It's a, <laughs> to the podcast for that one, guys. She had some very interesting family things happening. Yes. And uh, so, she, and she also held salons um, later on in her life. They, she held so, some salons and then she held them every day later on towards the ends of her life. And then I don't want to give much more away because there's some questions. And then Gertrude Stein, you all know Gertrude Stein, of course. And, you know, she she kind of brought the salon back um, when she was there. The salon, for the most part, um, was more of like a 17th, 18th century type of a thing, 19th century. Um, once the, the revolution kind of started breaking it up a little bit, but then a bunch of these women actually kind of brought it back. And then it kind of changed because it came a little bit more political, mm -hmm. which um, as we'll go through the questions that got some people in um, a lot of trouble. 
And then Marquise um, Rambouet, she was um, she was the one I didn't really know a lot about, but I kept coming across her name and different things. She um, actually did one of the very first salons in France, and she lived in um, she lived in a house that was very close to the Louvre. Now I just realize I'm probably giving something away. So, <laughs> but she had one of the very first ones. Uh, Rambouillet is um, a city outside of Paris as well. It's a, yeah, yeah. It's a forest. I guess it's named after her. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's probably who she, because if she was the Marquise, a lot of times like uh, with Madame de Maintenon that we did, uh, that's, uh, that's the, um, the, one, the one episode that we did of the podcast that'll be, um, will come with a parental guidance <laughs> warning. <laughs> Um, a lot of times, you know, like the like Louis the Fourteenth, like to get you know these women to be able to be in court, they needed to have a title, and he would just go out and just take one and buy one and be like, wow. now, now she's the Marquise de Rambouillet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She would just take her title. Yeah, anything can be bought, guys. Anything <laughs> can be bought. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's jump in and feel free to just throw some answers out there. I mean, we just love interacting with you. Our first question is, which leader hated the salons of Paris? So we're talking about the salons. So these type of salons are not the artsy salons. Or, right. Yeah. Right. And this is this is this isn't one of the women. So this is a, a leader in France. Yeah, this was a leader and he hated the salons. He was not a fan at all. Think of a very famous French leader. I think you can kind of put this one together about. I was going to say he was a bit of an egomaniac, but that pretty much narrows it down to all of them. <laughs> I mean, they built castles for themselves. I know. Yeah. I mean, we're very lucky. I mean, we're very happy that they were egomaniacs in some ways because they left behind some pretty beautiful stuff for us. But yeah, we're allowed to visit now. I yeah. Know open to the public in the past yes. <laughs> yeah there was that whole you know revolution kind of yeah thing around for everybody but yeah this guy did not like the salons at all and i mean did he try to shut them down um yes in a way okay and so anybody have a guess about who it was i mean we could give him like multiple choice i guess yeah. You, uh, the 16th, <laughs> Louis the 14th, Napoleon, or Henry the fourth. Don is correct. Is Napoleon. 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 Yeah. Um, well, and as you can imagine, you know, of course, Napoleon. I mean, Louis the 14th was pretty e egomaniac to, as well, of course. But I mean, Napoleon was kind of just, he was on a whole nother level. But he, um, would get he hated anything that was being said against him and you know they try to control everything so he actually would exile some of these people out and there was uh, madame de Stal. she um she was exiled out of there um he got really mad because she was very outspoken about politics and she was a royalist in a way so she was really against bonaparte and so he basically just sent her away was just oh, got wow. was just like you're out of here and exiled her, but then she came back and she kept doing it. She did it again, and because she that at that point, you know, early on, it was really a thing about the intellectuals, the writers, and the artists, and and um, then later on, it ended up becoming very political. So people would come, you know, and sit and talk about politics. There was some of them would have to have a rule of like you can't talk about politics, but um, Napoleon didn't like anything that was ever said, you know, that was against him. Yeah, of course. He wasn't a big fan of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, Carol knew it was Napoleon. <laughs> Good job, Carol. <laughs> How do you post a comment on the iPad? <laughs> the iPad? I'm sure, like, oh my gosh, Napoleon. I know. I don't. It's weird that the sometimes the iPad and the phone is so much different. Mm -hmm. It looks just like a giant phone and iPad, but sometimes yeah. it's a little more complicated. Yeah. All right, guys. Good guesses. The next question. What woman of the 1920s recreated the salons in her home to show off her art? So this is 1920s. You said, you know what? I'm going to show off my own art. I'll start my own salon in my living room. Who do we think that is out of our ladies? So I'm going to post the ladies again. It's 1920s. So that's probably a huge clue right there about who this could possibly be. But I will send that to you guys. Was it Ninon? Was it Juliet? Was it Gertrude? 
Or was it the Marquise? Don says Gertrude. Anyone else have a guess? That's a good guess, though. 1920s. I feel like I, I feel like this is the only woman that was alive in the 1920s out of this group, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Catherine, <laughs> Gertrude, nice. Catherine. Kathy and Catherine. And Don, you guys are good. You're right. 1920s, Gertrude Stein. She did. Um, and she actually, when she was in Baltimore, Maryland, Crystal's my hometown Crystal's birthplace. She um, was back there and she met these two women, the Cone sisters, and they were doing that. They were having salons in her house and inviting people over. And she had, she liked the idea, but a lot of it became um, when she got to Paris was because of Matisse, because their Gertrude and her brother Leo's art collection was getting so big that it was like going to an art gallery and Matisse, they, they were collecting a lot of Matisse. And so Matisse would be bringing people all the time. And Gertrude said she couldn't get any work done. So she had to put like a time limit like this at this time to this time, people could come over. Um, so people would come over, you know, it was depicted a little bit in, um, in midnight in Paris. And she would like really kick people out probably. Yeah. Like, oh, I got to get things done now people. Yeah. But um, that, that would be, uh, just to have seen all of her art collection at that time, I mean, must have been just amazing. I would have loved to have been invited to those salons. <laughs> Very cool. She was hanging out with all the best of them. Yes, she was. All right, guys. So who had Moliere and Jean de la Fontaine at her salon? So she had Moliere and Jean de la Fontaine. She had two big celebrities at her salons. Who do you think it was? Do you think it was Ninon, Juliette, Gertrude, or the Marquise? Moliere, Jean de la Fontaine. Fontaine. This should give you some clues, you know, of the time period. Mm -hmm. And every, I mean, most people I think know who Moliere and Jean de la Fontaine is. Uh, Fontaine was basically like the uh, French, our version of Aesop Fables. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote so many of those are really great. I bought, ended up, I bought this like French reader. So it's like, on, it's in French on one side and English on the other years ago, but it's like old French, like really, really old French. And so it's like, it's so hard. <laughs> I, say, I, would, I think the French would understand that. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think some French I know wouldn't even, they might not get, it's, it's uh, such that's written in such an old way. Yeah. Um, maybe they should have updated it, but it is pretty great because he has like, you know, the crow and the, what's it, the crow and the wolf with the piece of cheese and. Oh gosh, I don't know any of the French ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So it was actually Ninon de la Close, la Close. Yeah, Ninon, because it was the 17th century. So, uh, but she was the, the courtesan that really, embrace the salons um, and you know the courtesan as we like to call it you know the the fancy prostitute mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, I mean they were basically there's different there was different ranks you know there was the the Lorette and there was uh, that the courtesan was like you know the top so she would um, have authors and and royalty would even come to her salons and I mean she was a pretty big deal at the time not many, not many Americans, you know, it's not a big story. Many Americans know, but she was pretty fascinating. I can't, like I said earlier, I can't wait for that podcast. Episode. Yeah. Ninon, you guys need to look up. She was a very interesting lady and people don't really know about her. She was rubbing yeah. out with very important people. Very important people. Yeah. She, uh, she, uh, I was just checking. I was like, wait, if I say this, if I give you away the question, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, uh, she, you know, she, there's different royalty would come to her royalty would come to her salons. Like it was the, the place to be in Paris was at her salon. And I've never heard of her until I spoke to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So when and where did the salons begin? So we'll give you some clues here. Uh, when and where? So what century and what country? Do you think it was France? Do you think it was Spain? Do you think it was Italy? Or do you think it was the 14th, 15th, or 16th century? When and where did the salons begin? So Spain, Italy, or France, or 14th, 15th, or 16th century? They've been going on a long time. Mm -hmm. And you would think that they were actually founded in France. I mean, because that's mainly where they were famous. 
Yeah, I don't know if they do a lot of them anymore. I know that um, in the 1950s and 60s, there was people still doing them because James Beard, he, um, the America's first foodie, we call him. He was originally from, he was born and raised in Portland. He went there and he um, was in, went to a salon and discovered these sandwiches and they were just um, brioche and it had butter on it and then like diced up onions. And then it's like, and then it had herbs, like different herbs on it. And it was his very favorite sandwich. And gross. It, like plain onions, like not cooked. Yeah. But they were like diced up. They're just, and they're more sweeter. So, mm -hmm. or they're like sliced really thin. And so every year um, in my old job, I used to do a big event that was dedicated to him because the down at the coast is where he also would live. And um, it's where my family has always had a house. So I have like a real closeness to him, but he had, he first discovered these at a salon and I had spent like so much time trying to find out which salon he was at. But then, you know, that's when this was like years and years ago when I realized, Oh, these salons were all the time. It wasn't just yeah. like, you know, one person had them. Yeah. Everybody was doing it. Mm -hmm. All right. So Don says Italy, 15th century, not a bad guess. Catherine says France in the 16th century, also not a bad guess. Carol says Italy, 15th century. And Kathy says Italy, 16th century. Well, you guys are all pretty good guessers, but Kathy is the winner. It was Italy in the 16th century. Great job. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah they started in Italy and then they were really popular there at first. And then they kind of came to France in the 17th centuries, 17th and 18th centuries when they were really pretty prolific. Um, and the 19th is when people got a little bit more outspoken about it. And, you know, people were some people exiled and imprisoned and, you know, probably killed because they were having these in their home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were. It's like, kind of, do they have to be secret about it? Like, only certain i mean i'm sure certain time periods they have to keep it secret yeah i think i think once it once it once it delved into politics i think they had to be a lot more secretive about it and you know that period after the revolution like during the revolution and after the revolution with the people that were more royalist you know and now you have the bonapartes though that's when the big problem started it makes sense that it would start in italy though love mm -hmm. italy <laughs> All right, guys. So who began her salon at the age of 20 years old? I mean, this is a very young age to be starting your own like art salon. Um, and it's one of our four ladies. Do you think it was Ninon, Juliette, Gertrude, or the Marquise Rambouillet? Who do you think, guys? Started at age 20. I definitely don't think it was Gertrude Stein. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not in her 20s when she moved to France. <laughs> so we can definitely like single that one out. The Marquise, I feel like she'd be pretty busy being a Marquise. You know, she had to like work her way up the, the social ladder before she started hosting people. And hers were, I mean, hers were early. Hers started in like 1606 or six, 1600. That's cool. around 1600. So that leaves Juliet and Ninon. And who do we think started it at the age of 20? That's crazy. That's so young. It's like she knew about art at that age. I mean, they did start educating them young, I guess. She was passionate. She was Don, passionate. Don says Ninon, not a bad guess. Anybody else have a guess about who started their salons at the young age of 20 years old? That is very young to be doing things like that. Intelligent things. Yeah. <laughs> That was probably like being an old lady back then, making it to 20. You were That's, it's, yeah, I mean, when you think that most of these people were married when they were like 14 or 15, mm -hmm. 20s like middle age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So Don said Ninon, and then he changed to Juliet. So we're going with this last answer, Juliet. And then Catherine said Ninon. So it's between Juliet and Ninon. Do we have a tiebreaker, guys? Anybody else think it was Juliet or Ninon? 20 years old she was very young actually it was correct uh now i'm confusing myself done yes juliet that it was, was Julia, it. but you know i wouldn't um i i bet ninon is also right i'm not i haven't found exactly it was what it said but she was pretty young when she started doing all the things that she was doing yeah um, so, you know they're probably both right but juliet um she got married when she was 15 um yeah. 
and it that's an incredibly interesting story and you know the for the uh for the podcast but a little sneak peek of that is she ended up marrying this man that was also thought to be her father because her mother also would have um would also have salons and this man would always come to one and her father her her what her mother's husband i should call him was uh-huh. gone a lot and so she ended up marrying getting married off to this man because it was during the time right right when right about when the revolution was starting and so he wanted to make sure that she would be able to get his inheritance and so he married her and they had a very the completely platonic marriage. Um, but it's kind of interesting. It was, so when we did the podcast, it was like, wait a minute, the father? No. And I was like, this is the husband, fa- the husband slash father. <laughs> I was so confused by that podcast. I was like, wait, husband, dad, very confusing. Mm-hmm. But they had a, they had a home and it was on a Rue Mont Blanc, Rue de Mont Blanc, which is a different it's street, doesn't it? It's a different street now. But she, yeah, she was, she got married when she was 15 and by 20, she was already having salons which were like one of the most popular talked about salons in paris at 20 years old yeah good networker she was the first linkedin she was. <laughs> um, all right guys so the next question which courtesan of the 17th century was a close confidant of louis the 14th because of her salon so it's the 17th century guys she's hanging out with louis who do we think it was? Once again, we can kick out Gertrude. Uh, if we don't, Marquise Rambouillet, Juliet, <laughs> or Ninon. Who do we think was hanging out with Louis in the 17th century? Ninon, Juliet, or the Marquise? I want to be a close confidant of Louis the 14th. It's hanging out. Do you think well, it's, a, it's like a uh, the cemetery, Père Lachaise? It was actually named after the priest Pierre um, Pierre che- de la Chaise, and he was the confidant of of Louis the Fourteenth, which I think must have been the strange. I mean, that the the basically the Louis the Fourteenth is telling this guy every one of his dirty secrets. <laughs> yeah, that's strange. I didn't know that. Yeah. Père Lachaise, beautiful cemetery. I never, I always feel weird telling my friends to go to a cemetery, but it really is a beautiful cemetery. It is, I love that, I love it. So Louis, Don with Don guesses Marquis, and not a bad guess. Anybody else have a guess about who Louis the 14th was hanging out with in the 17th century because of her salons? I think uh, this is a pretty tough one. This would be one. This takes me back to dad, husband situation. <laughs> That's a clue. <laughs> and I just noticed when I wrote all these, I wrote this uh, 17 siècle. I wrote it in French. Yeah, you did. <laughs> You're speaking Franklish now. I do that a lot. Like I don't ever write and. I always write a. <laughs> like in, in anything. And I just catch myself all the time doing it. That's a good thing. All right, guys. So it was actually Nino once again. She was just chilling with uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and uh, they became besties. Oh, yeah, he he would come to visit her, and he was uh, he'd actually had great confidence in her, and would you know when he would listen to everybody else telling him what he should do, he would go and he actually he actually had a phrase, "What would Ninon say?" Wow! And so he would go he would go see her and talk to her and get her advice. That's so crazy. Mm-hmm. Which ended up kind of getting her in trouble later, but we'll get we'll go over that. <laughs> yeah to the podcast for the rest of that story. You didn't yeah. want to piss off Louis the 14th, guys. Not a good guy to make angry. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. I mean, I think you'd be better off getting, you know, Louis the 16th. I don't, I, he was a little bit more passive about things. <laughs> Just a little. Just a little bit. Um, so the next one is, whose salon was held in her home that is in what we see as the, the Cour Napoleon at the Louvre? So her salon was held in her home, and now it's a part of the Louvre. Am I understanding that correctly? Well, like the the way the Louvre, where the pyramid is now, mm-hmm. that used to be homes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, even when it was a palace, it used to be filled. There were used to be tons and tons of homes in there. So the homes were right up against the palace. And they demolished them. <laughs> 
Oh, interesting. I had no idea. I just thought the palace had to be like away from the peasants, you know, like we can't be. Well, because originally it was, you know, much, much smaller. Yeah, they kept adding. If you go into the core carré in the back, you could kind of, um, if you're standing there where the fountain is in the middle, that was kind of the eastern eastern corner. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't very, it wasn't very big. Yeah, first. crazy. Don, you are correct. It was the Marquise Rambouillet. She used to live in what is now the Cur Napoleon. Yeah, she actually, um, she was, she had the very first song, it was 1607. And she had a, their house was on the Rue St. Thomas de Louvre. And it was in, it was within inside of there. That's so wild. I wish I could see like drawings from that period. I'm sure they exist. Yeah, I mean, it was the same around um, Notre Dame. Like Notre Dame is basically, it didn't have that big, you know, area outside of it originally. It had homes like right up to the edges of it. Yeah, I watched a really cool uh, documentary about them, the History Channel of them building Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. It's really cool mm -hmm. to see how it changed over the years. Good job, Don. Good job, Don. Who, who was jailed by the Queen Mother to stop the influence of her salon? So who made the Queen angry? And she was put in jail. Who do you guys think? Well, obviously, once again, we can rule out Gertrude. <laughs> <laughs> she was not around during the Queen times. Uh, was it Ninon, Juliette, or the Marquise? I don't think you want to piss the Queen off because obviously you end up in jail. Like this poor woman. Yeah, most of the most of the queens weren't uh, weren't so nice half the time. Yeah, I mean, they probably were a little frustrated because their husbands were sleeping with everybody in France with them. That's true. And it was like kind of an arranged marriage situation. A lot of, we you know, repression. And this wasn't even Catherine de Medicis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So who do you think was jailed by the queen mother to stop the influence of her salon? Was it Ninon and Juliet? Gertrude or the Marquise? Don says Juliet. That's not a bad guess. Once again, Don, you're a pretty good guesser. Carol says Ninon. Oh, it's Carol. Hi, Carol. Don. Hey, Carol. Carol and Don. Uh, anybody else have a guess? I like that Carol's going against Don. She's like, I am not agreeing with my husband. <laughs> well, Carol is the winner in this one, Don. It was Ninon. She's it correct. It was Ninon, and it was uh, Anne of Austria. Did not like the influence that she had over her son, Louis the Fourteenth. So she um, had her locked up. She sent her to prison. But then another queen, um, Queen uh, Christina of Sweden, was um, a big fan of Ninon's and would come to her salons. And so she begged. Uh, she talked to and begged um, Cardinal Mazarin to let her out, and they did. That's a good friend to have, you know, the one that can get you out of jail. That's yeah. And then I saw later I came across um, the uh, the Queen of Sweden was then later exiled down to Italy. Oh, wow. Yeah. I came across that this the other day. I was like, wait a minute. Wait, that's the same person. <laughs> I was getting locked up. <laughs> I think people, yeah, people got thrown into the clink all the time then. It was yeah. better than losing your head, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Which was probably soon after. Mm -hmm. um, next question. Go, Carol. What woman's salon set the trend of the Etruscan Etruscan style? Am I saying it right? Mm -hmm. Etruscan style. I want to say it like the French way, but I don't know. I know. Okay. So what woman's salon set the trend of the Etruscan style? First off, Claudine might want to explain Etruscan style for some people. Maybe they don't know what that is. Um, well. I don't want to explain too much because it might give it away. <laughs> in the answer. So this is a woman's salon that set the trend of the Etruscan style. Maybe you know what the Etruscan style is. Maybe you're going to learn in another minute. But what woman's salon started that trend? Listen to that word, Etruscan style. Where do you think that's from? What that is? Here's our list of ladies again. Her salon started a trend of Etruscan style. Was it Ninon, Juliet, Gertrude, or the Marquise? I kind of feel like Gertrude could be a person that uh, would start such a trend. She's, she was just always doing cool things. All these women sound like, you know, they were ahead of their time. Especially, especially Ninon. I mean, considering 
the time that that was that's uh where she was just like nope i'm not gonna get married i'll go lose my virginity and you yeah. can't me off <laughs> yeah, obviously it was just like living her life mm -hmm. <laughs> she did not care yeah, i can't what date is that uh ninong comes out next month november 9th Yep, November 9th, you guys can learn more about Ninon. I was fascinated by her story because once again, dad husband situation, very strange. And it's really like, I mean, it's, it's some of these, some women are, it's it's not easy to find information on. And then sometimes you find it and it's very, you know, like you find one thing saying that they had eight children and then another one that they had one children. And, you know, it's just, it's uh yeah, the history records are a little mixed up from that. Especially the farther back you go. You know, the farther back you go, we have uh, Queen Barrett, which is an awesome one. I mean, she was, it was like, what, five, like 500, like the sixth century. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot, you know, but that yeah. that's a really interesting story. Yeah, I love any information we found on that person. Mm -hmm. So it actually was Juliet. And I'll have Claudine describe what the Etruscan style is. Well, she she was one of the she was she was pretty stylish and she was kind of ahead of the trends of everything. And so she they decorated their home in a lot of the Etruscan style, which is it's very um it's very Greek. And she would wear these the Greek Greek style dresses and which would end up later becoming the Empire style, which is, you know, like you always see where it's just the um you know, the, the waist comes up to like just right below their chest and it's just a lot fitted. It was a, you know, that's what you always would see Josephine wearing. So that was kind of ended up becoming the empire style, but she, Juliet kind of did it first. Uh, a trendsetter. And it was same thing in their home. Like their home was beautifully decorated. They ended up having um, her husband, her husband, father, <laughs> would always like uh, have problems keeping the sub jobs. And so they would end up kind of having to sell things after a while and move and go to a different place. And so she, um, she definitely had to, you know, re recycle and reinvent everything over and over again. I can only imagine interesting household. Yeah. All right, guys. So father, who, husband. <laughs> father, father, husband, who salon had to have a strict no politics rule. So which one of these salons do you think they were saying, don't you dare talk about politics, which I feel like that's what these salons were about. I mean, it was about art, but also just to discuss the world and politics and things like that. Some people didn't want to talk about politics, though. So do we think it was Nina, Juliet, Gertrude, or the Marquise? Rambouillet. I love saying Rambouillet. We used to go there to pick mushrooms. They're famous for their mushrooms. Yum. Yes, you can go in the forest and find them. It's like mushroom time now. Yes, it is. Yeah, the fall. You got to make sure you pick the right mushrooms, guys. Yeah. Don says Gertrude. Not a bad guess. That was my first guess as well, Gertrude. Who decided no talking about politics at their salons? Definitely no politics. I, I feel like I would make that a rule too, especially in today's times. Oh, yeah. Not talk about it. <laughs> not talk about it in general. <laughs> Art, <laughs> history. Catherine saying Gertrude as well. It does feel like a very Gertrude uh, move, you know. Yeah, I think more Gertrude. Uh, Carol saying Ninon. I like Carol sticking with Ninon. Well, I like, I like them watching together. I like that. A good team. It was Juliet, guys. It actually was Juliet. It was Juliet. She was very close with a um, a woman named Madame de Stal, and she was one that had I talked about earlier that she had a salon and she was very involved in politics. And she had written pamphlets, like she wrote a pamphlet at one point, basically defending Marie Antoinette, um, like one of the very early versions of defending her and how crooked that trial was, which is true i mean it was horrible um but she was very outspoken she was kind of a royalist she was even going to try to um get uh, she tried to hatch a plan so that mary antoinette and the could escape but then you know they didn't do that but she ended up getting exiled by napoleon and uh, so juliet was very close with her and so she got a little worried too so she ended up leaving as well she came back to paris and she started her salon what she was doing like every day and she would have um she was very close with um chateaubriand 
and a bunch of other people and she would have a salon and then she had to make a strict no politics rule because it got them in so much trouble before mm -hmm. that they said, you know, we can't talk about politics. Yeah, she didn't want to get exiled again. She was gonna, yeah, she didn't want to get exiled again. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no one wants to be exiled from France. No. And some of them were like Madame de Stahl was like exiled like at first, like 10, like 10 kilometers outside of Paris. So oh, it wasn't yeah. like, you know, they sent you off to this deserted island where, you know, you're talking to a volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't Tom Hanks. No. I mean, yeah. I guess my house was far without cars. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Or that far. It wasn't an island, though. No. All right, guys. We are getting down to our last two questions. Thank you for playing along with us. We love hearing from you. And what period of time grew due to the salon? So this was a certain time period and it grew because of the salons so what can you think of some time periods you know there's certain names for different history periods and which one of them do you think was growing due to the salons i mean people are hanging out talking about art politics what do you think was growing because of that what time period and I'll give you a hint. It is um, one of the reasons why Paris is known as the city of light. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That is very cool. I'm learning so much. I love it. That sounds so much smarter now. I like that. Yeah, it's not necessarily only because of light, like you think. Yeah, because there's been a long time that it didn't mm -hmm. have light. With all the intellectuals coming to Paris. Somebody told me the first building to have electricity in Paris was the Moulin Rouge. Um, I think, well, from what I know is the Théâtre de Lorient mm -hmm. is one of the ones that had the first gas lights because they actually still have a few of them. Like when you walk around, if you're on the Jardin de Luxembourg side and you go underneath the um, colonnade, couldn't think of the word, there's yeah. lights up there and they were the original ones that had gas. Oh, that's cool. Which they also, because of because of the Théâtre de Lodion, uh, Rue de Lodion, my favorite street, it was the first one to have sidewalks outside of Pont Neuf. That's crazy that sidewalks took so long to exist. And considering, think about what they were walking in. Yeah, ugh, all the horses and the mud and the ugh, mm -hmm. people throwing their stuff in there. That's why they have all those really cool things by all the, like, the big doors. Oh, you had to wipe your feet. Particular. Yeah. yeah some of those, some of, there's some of them where you would actually wipe your feet. I mean, it was to protect the corners, but it was also to, so you could wipe your feet on things. There's still some. Yeah, there's a lot in Walmart still. Mm -hmm. I see them all the time on the streets here. So Kathy says the belly poke. That's not a bad guess. The Renaissance is done. The belly poke. Yeah, these are good guesses, guys. I really like this now that I know the answer about, you know, light. Lights is kind of in the word, guys. <laughs> How much am I giving away here? This is a time period, and the word light is in the word. And that's why Paris is called the City of Light as well, if you're just tuning in. Because a, a lot of people call it the City of Lights, but it's City of Light. Yes. It's funny you say that because I had an online magazine when I lived, started living in Paris and I would write on the title, um, the city of lights. And I had a, a person, a random person say, it's actually the city of light because that would just drive me crazy. I'd be like, I can't even look at the magazine. <laughs> probably you, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia <is> amazing. <laughs> uh, Carol got it. Enlightenment. Yes. It was. Yes, it was the enlightenment. Um, they, you know, a lot of those writers would actually gather at the salons and then the message kind of got spread. So it kind of in a lot of ways really helped get that information out there um, and spread through Paris. And it, you know, it was the perfect opportunity. You've got this area that this group of people that were, you know, wanted to learn more from these intellectuals. So it was a great, it was a great way to spread the news. Spread the light. Spread the light. <laughs> light. I think very literal, like, you know, actual light, but it can be as well as like a mental light bulb. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And that's where it was the, the city of light was also because it was around that same time. Fascinating. Well, now you guys can all tell your Paris friends uh, something interesting. So the city of light comes from the city of enlightenment. I love it. I learned so much. Claudine, you're amazing. <laughs> you're amazing for tuning in and chatting with us. And we all want to be in Paris. I'm in Paris. Everybody come hang out with me.
it's very lonely <laughs> because everyone's not here. I know. I did. I just saw that they uh, they're stopping any new visas. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just I turned off the news because I just can't handle it. Yeah. Are we in World War Three yet? No. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna focus on La Be Creative. So you guys, if you want more fun things every week, you know, we do the podcast. Mondays we talk about history and Wednesdays we talk to living artists. And then we both have Patreon pages and you should definitely sign up for Claudine's Patreon pages if you love history because she does like history for you. She'll answer any questions. I mean, Claudine can tell you better. Oh, and Claudine's getting marriage proposals. Oh. Well, thank you. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm so excited. And Don, you will love this one too because I brought, I mentioned, I think you and I maybe on Instagram chatted about it. Tomorrow, the episode is about jo uh, Joanne um, Van Gogh. And I, I just absolutely love her. And I'm sure that you guys probably know a little bit about her, but she was amazing. And if it wasn't for her, we probably would never know who Vincent Van Gogh was, which is so crazy. I didn't know about her. Yeah. She's her. just, amazing 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 so i can't wait for people to get to hear that one that's good that's one of my favorites yeah tune in tomorrow guys listen to you know van gogh's uh, it was sister-in-law that's who she was sister-in-law she was married to teo and they were only um you know and teo died just months after um just months after vincent did and so joanna was left with a basically i think it was like a nine-month-old baby in her apartment filled with um, paintings and her brother and other people told her just to throw them out, to get rid of them. Wow, she would have thrown away all Vincent Van Gogh's artwork, thank God. Yeah, I mean, considering he only sold one painting while he was alive, I mean, it was basically the bulk of everything that he had. Most of it was with, you know, his brother in the apartment and, and she was so far ahead of her time in what she did. And yeah, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I think that we'd probably, we wouldn't know who Vincent was as a person. That's for sure. Cause she, she uh, transcribed all of their letters and Th Teo saved every single letter from Vincent, which they would send letters sometimes almost every day. Vincent didn't save any of the ones from Teo, but he, um, some of them, I actually have some photos on my website tomorrow that it actually, he would actually sketch out like, you know, the yellow room with the bed, you know, the, the image at, everybody knows of Van Gogh. He actually sketched it out and sent it in the letter to his brother saying, this is something I'm working on. Wow. That's mm -hmm. so crazy. pretty amazing. Yeah. A lot of those letters are in the museum now in Amsterdam, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And go. all of like all, most of his the personal collection that originally was Joanna's um, that Teo had is, is the basis of that museum too. So crazy. So basically, guys, tune into the podcast tomorrow. You can learn all about how she basically saved Vincent Van Gogh's artwork and made him famous. I mean, he didn't yeah. do it while he was alive. That was for sure. Yeah, he's amazing. Catherine, thanks for tuning in the last minute. Kathy, Don, Catherine, Carol, Sandra, Ellen. Thank you guys all so much for coming. No thank you. Thank you for coming to. <laughs> and uh, we will see you guys in another two weeks. And also just listen to the podcast and check out our links whenever you want more. And we will chat with you guys soon. Thanks so much again. A bientôt. <laughs> <laughs>